Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to lecture 10b. Uh, in this particular lecture, we're going to be reviewing the building code, particularly the Ontario building code, but definitely would have connections to the national uh, building code and um, give you a really good, even if you're watching this um, and you didn't want to know directly to the, un to the building code, it'll give you a definite understanding of stairs and connections to uh, code compliance, which is um, always helpful. Uh, a lot of the illustrations in this particular lecture are taken from the Illustrated Code Series, Housing and Small Buildings, um, written by Tony Boyko and Stephen Penna. Uh, I would highly recommend this book overall if you are studying the building code. It really saves you a lot of time. It covers all aspects of part nine of the building code, and you know we've been talking about residential construction technology in this course. Um, we really haven't been diving into the specifics of building code other than particular areas. So I thought it would be very helpful to get a good sense of how building code works. And a visual um, story of the building code is very helpful when it's nonfiction. And um, this book has uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of illustrations of various aspects of wood frame construction and um, as we know part nine of the building code is for building 600 square meters or less three stories in height or less not for assembly purposes um, primarily for residential purposes um, gives you a good sense of uh, what the requirements are because there are a lot of requirements and i will of course tie that to our understanding constructions drawing for housing and small building uh, chapter uh, 13, I think I have a few examples in here of the brook drawings and a few other interrelated things such as um, termites and other things that um, we deal with uh, uh, locally for sure. Um, so um, really it, it is a helpful book. You can get that there as I mentioned and um, we'll go on. So I think I've got that pretty much explained there. You can always freeze this slide and go through um, the text on it. All right. So um, when we talk about uh, stairs, um, stair width, at least one stair serving each story in a house and exterior stairs should be at least 860 millimeters wide. So basically what you need to understand, again, even though, you know, I'm referring to this book and I'm referring to my drawings and my own book, um, codes change. So as I'm speaking, codes could be changing. So you always have to um, reference the current building code or the drawings that were approved on that particular building code. Um, so there is also a process of transition, you know, when something has something approved and uh, basically uh, the uh, drawings that you're working with and then the codes change while you're halfway in construction, there's a transition process that allows for things that are in progress um, to complete that way. So there definitely for width, um, there is minimum standards. Remember, these are minimums, not maximums in this particular case. So in certain cases, there's maximums as well, especially when we talk about stairs. Uh, if it's too narrow, you really can't get stuff up there. There's nothing worse than trying to move things in a residential house and the stairs are too tight or the headroom is too small and you can't fit whatever the object is that you want to get up and down the stairs. And so um, there are minimum requirements as a result of that. And earlier in the course, we looked at that case study uh, with the stairs, with the um, woman that had the unfortunate event that fell off the stairs, of, off the landing up here, went through the handrail and fell onto the ground um, with her um, infant child. Um, fortunately, it turned out okay for them. Uh, but uh, those kind of conditions are problematic and stairs that are not well constructed or stairs that are well, not well can maintained, um, even more problematic with outdoor stairs because everything is deteriorating over time. It's weather, weather um, uh, based and it's susceptible to those conditions. So rot uh, occurs, heaving occurs, there's all sorts of things that happen. But um, when something is built, it it is also in a condition like this. When was it built? You know, was it built 30 years ago? Well, um, then it would have been, you know, if you're trying to say the builder built it wrong, well, it would have been under the building code of 30 years ago, not necessarily the current building code. 
And so maximum height of stairs, where the vertical height of a run of stairs is greater than 3.7 meters, you need to have a landing. Otherwise, you know, if somebody falls down the stairs, it's too far, or too long. There's no rest point for anybody part way. So they do have a maximum height for a single run of stairs. Um, so it's important to know that too. And you're going to find there, I'm just going over a few of the things in stairs. There's even a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more in that illustrated guide. There's a lot more in the building code. Um, but for our purposes, I just wanted you to get a good sense of some of the requirements uh, that are, that do come into fruition in the building code. So if we have a circular stairs, um, then essentially uh, we have certain requirements as well. So a minimum run on the inside radius of the stringer would be 150 millimeters. They kind of look at what um, the path of travel is. So the path of travel is, so here what they're saying, average run not less than 200 millimeters. So if you're taking it at the outer and the inner, you're adding them together, you're dividing it by two, um, the average should not be um, less than um, 200 um, millimeters. So it's, it's referring to um, that point of view when you're talking about dimensions for angled um, treads. And not more than its run and at any point and not more than its run plus um, 25 millimeters. And then now you're talking about um, nosings. So here, this is from the Brook drawings. Uh, that um, we've been looking at and reviewing under the Understanding Construction Drawings for Housing and Small Buildings textbook. Um, in the Brook drawing, so Cassidy and Company, uh, the architectural company that uh, does the drawings for that, they have in their construction notes a listing of stairs um, and also for exterior stairs and guardrails and handrails. And so these are pretty much taken straight out of the code of that time. Remember I said things can change, so don't necessarily go 100% with that. Particularly if you're looking from the National Building Code, there's some uh, nuanced differences in some things like um, uh, maximum rise on uh, public stairs is a little bit different and those types of things. But these being a, a residential, uh, from a residential purposes, uh, these are uh, what we have here on these particular drawings. And so we have minimum rise, um, five inches. So there is a minimum, but there is a maximum. As I said, there's maximums with stairs too. Uh, you don't want to have, that's usually the biggest constraint is the rise, right? Because you want to try to, you're always with this limit, uh, limited run. And we talked about that in the previous video lecture, which is uh, 10A. And when I sort of laid out uh, a stairs and I laid it out with an unlimited run but then I also said well you could shorten the unit runs if you needed to up to um, the uh, building code minimum so there's the minimum run 210 well maximum rise you know if you go to a higher maximum rise that will typically overall mean you might get away with one less step uh, if you get away with one less step you've saved that whole horizontal distance of that one unit run or tread for that step, tread minus the 25 millimeters. So that, that can be significant when you're trying to save space at the bottom of the stairs. So it's very important to know where your constraints are. So number one, you don't contravene them. And number two, if you get stuck space-wise, you know what you can do and what you can't do. And so that comes into um, the fold. And of course, designers, have done these calculations when they've done the drawing, so things should work out okay. But sometimes, for what a variety of reasons, something's not quite okay. So then you want to know what the parameters are and what you can um, do about that to make it work. And we also talked in the previous lecture, because this lecture is really about building code, we talked about most comfortable stairs, rise and run. And that's trying to get something that's a very comfortable climb. Well, the building code just gives sort of the minimum and maximums, making sure that nothing is too far outside what would be comfortable. Um, so those are some of the um, nuances uh, between those areas. And we can see here, uh, you've got things like minimum headroom, uh, 1950 or six foot five. And so they've got both in metric and they put the conversion in Imperial, the building code will only tell you the metric in Canada, right? So these would be the comparables in inches. Um, yeah, and so, and I would always 
check to make sure it is with um, building code uh, requirements because you're only going to see it in metric in the building code. All right, so we we get that um, point, and this was the minimum run. These are for curved stairs, what we just looked at previously, and so there you can see that 150 and then the 200 average there where that's coming from. And then we've got guards and handrails, all right? So a handrail is, is what's going up the side of a stairs, and a guardrail is what goes along a landing uh, between the second and first floor where it's open so somebody doesn't fall over. Um, so that's the difference between a guardrail and a handrail. The handrail is going up the side of the stairs, and the guardrail is going across the top of landings and openings and that sort of thing. Um, so you can see that um, there's a bunch of requirements uh, in there for that um, and you can see handrail at interior stair minimum two foot eleven um, and uh, that's the minimum um, maximum interior handrail at interior stair guardrail or stair or floor handrail at interior stair uh, minimum and interior stair maximum hmm. I guess I'm gonna have to come back to this and maybe cut this part out because I'm not sure What's going on there? Guardrail, handrail, exterior, landing. That's fine. Handrail, oh. Okay, got it. And we have here guard at interior landing or stair or floor. So handrail at interior stair minimum. So now we're talking about the handrail going up the stairs. You can have it within a range from two foot seven to two foot eleven inches interior. Guardrail, handrail at exterior landing. We've got um, three foot two inches or nine hundred and sixty-five. And then if it's greater than eighteen hundred above the finished grade, we've got a thousand and seventy, which is like forty-two um, inches in that case. So um, if how far you have above the ground, that's dictating how far you could potentially fall. Uh, they have it um, one step up. So basically going from uh, three foot two inches to 42 inches, right? Guardrail, handrail at a landing, um, then it's also got these sides. Uh, so then if we're looking at the handrail, it's, uh, it's basically at um, those ranges going up the side of a stairs, if you will. And um, that would be your, your dif differences there. So here we've got wood pickets, uh, maximum. We've got four inches between. So that's the spacing between the balusters or the spindles or the pickets, you know, whatever terminology you want to use for that. Um, that's what it's referring to. And that's so uh, a small child couldn't squeeze through and then fall over. Uniformity, this one's actually very important. Uniformity and tolerance for risers and stairs. So I said in the previous lecture, you want to have them all even. Well, you know what? In the world of construction, there's no perfection. So what do we mean by even and what's an acceptable tolerance? If you, say, if you put in as an acceptable tolerance, then you know, you can challenge something that you see is a little bit outside. You've established what's acceptable. So this is pretty important. So five millimeters between adjacent, adjacent treads or landings. Um, so that would be like, you shouldn't have five, more than a five millimeter difference between here and here and there and there. All right. And five millimeters is a small amount, right? So five millimeters is a small amount. Um, 10 millimeters between the tallest and shortest risers in a flight. So somewhere along the line, if things have spread out, I shouldn't find any difference more than 10 millimeters, which is about roughly three eighths of an inch, but 10 millimeters is what the code requires. So those are my um, tolerance levels. And you better make sure that um, they fit because sometimes the stairs could just fall outside the tolerances and then trying to work them like if it's a poured concrete stairs or if it's a wooden stairs, you know, it becomes a human, it can potentially become a humongous job or meaning that you have to redo the stairs completely. Uh, so you better make sure that they're following within those tolerances. I've seen cases where on an LRT, um, there were, they were outside the tolerances and it was one heck of a job to try to 
uh, bring them in when they were concrete. You know, when you're trying to grind and try and get it from uh, a seven millimeter uh, to adjacent steps down to a five millimeter, and you've got them in these different locations, big problem. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're following that and there is measurements. So these are just showing you how an inspector could enforce the building code. Like really, if you didn't have that, then it becomes kind of a judgment thing. And that's a problem because maybe you're one millimeter off between risers. Well, that's not really a significant amount. Nobody's going to trip over a one millimeter difference. But more than a five millimeter, it starts to get into that zone where somebody's going to potentially stumble and trip because uh, your, your mind gets it down to memory, right? So they have those tolerance levels put in there. Winder stairs. So you got to have rules around winders. Winders are a great space saver. You know, we talked about limited run. Well, if I'm able to go up and change direction at the same time, I'm saving this whole space because otherwise this would be a landing and then I would have to go up one, two, three more steps. So you could imagine that would take up that much more space over here. So winders save a ton of space getting from one floor to the other. The problem with winders is they can be more dangerous than regular stairs. So you got to put some rules around it to try to limit it um, because as it goes down in, in the closer you are to um, the uh, center point over here, the smaller your tread is. So you want to try to have it that it's reasonable where your path of travel is, but it's still... They, having lived in a house with winders and fallen down the stairs a few times with winders, I can tell you they're, they're not as safe as um, regular stairs. So within the building code, you can do it, um, and it almost looks like this one's a kite shape uh, when you do it with three steps. They're all sort of equally uh, spaced, the, the radius on each one to 30 degrees. So at least these are even around their path of travel. Or you could do it uh, with 45. So you have one and two. Um, going into that um, step, uh, which again, it can save a fair amount of space if space is an issue. You see sometimes in older stairs, I've seen where they actually kept going all the way around. Uh, you can't do that anymore with uh, a winder stairs uh, where you'd have like six winders just going right around. Um, so in other words, it would end up going back up the stairs here. Uh, that wouldn't meet code requirements. And where more than one set of winders occur in a stair run, the winders must be separated by a distance of 1,200 millimeters. All right, so that's where you can't go right around. That's what's preventing that. Landings are required at the top of the bo bottom of the stairs. If I went through my photographs, uh, some of the uh, bed and breakfasts and Airbnbs I've stayed at, there's some interesting stairs, I'll tell you. Um, you come out the door and you're in the middle of a winder or you're in the middle of a stairs and um, very, very sort of dangerous if you're not sure um, where you are or something and you got to go to the washroom down the stairs at night. Uh, so it can be very precarious how they did that probably before the code requirements or without having it inspected, inspected. That's usually how that happens. Um, so. Door not to permitted to swing over the stairs. Well, you could imagine that somebody's coming up the stairs and somebody pushes open the door. They could um, knock that person coming down the stairs. Uh, door is a sliding door, swings away from the stair or is a storm door. A landing is not required on an exterior stair, uh, secondary stair where the stair has three risers or less. Three risers is, is kind of a key that you'll see that um, with decks and things of um, that uh, nature, you tend to um, not have as stringent requirements because the fall is not as significant. Um, but once you go beyond that, then handrails and everything else starts to come into play. Well, three risers keeping to code requirements is less than two feet, right? So dimensions of landings, you know, typically landing in a straight run. So um, whatever the width is, then it has to be at least the width um, length here. So minimum 860 millimeters interior and minimum 900 exterior. So following the minimum width of the stairs, right? So other, obviously it can't get thinner at the top where or wherever your landing um, may be. And then they've got different sort of examples here, right? Landing through 30 to 90 degrees, um, just um, illustrating those differences. Handrail only required on one side of an exterior stress uh, stair, having more than three risers serving a single dwelling unit. 
there's limitations on this too so just be careful how you're interpreting this because you know you can't have a stairs going all the way up to a uh, another floor and not have a railing on both sides but um, on a smaller um, steps like this um, you could 865 to 950 so there's that variance in rise for the handrail that we said so it's it can be in that range um, for that to work uh, guard required uh, last custom house i had i had to make sure on the second floor there was a window that was pretty close to the floor same idea uh, there had to be a guardrail on it because um, you know somebody could run into it fall out of it uh, there there's a lot of um, other issues that can happen so um, these requirements were windows situated over a stair or landing, really a floor, and the window extends to less than 900 millimeter above the stair or landing. The window must be protected with a guard conforming to section 9.88, or the window must be non-openable and designated to withstand the loading in article 4.151.14. Likely that would, if you looked at that, that would have requirements for um, laminated glass or something similar to that in the window. So height of guards, uh, when we look at height of guards, we have 900 uh, millimeters if it's an uh, interior stair. So for the height of guards, um, from that perspective, we can't be uh, less than that. And that includes the railing on the actual stairs. And then 1,070, where we're greater than 1,800 above the adjacent ground. And 900 millimeters, where we're less than 1800 above the um, finished ground so there you can have a little bit lower railing if you're less than that so that comes into play here so the height of guards for exterior stairs and landing more than 10 meters above adjacent ground uh, level should be not less than 1500 millimeters so we're getting really so so in like condominium buildings that sort of thing uh, they've got um, really strict requirements and there's been a whole bunch of uh, requirements regarding guardrails on condominium buildings because of the glass uh, using glass railings there was a lot of problems with the quality of the glass and it, it, <coughs> it being uh, tempered glass and uh, shattering so you can google that and see some of the stories on that but uh, they've had to change some a lot of the requirements around it to make it laminated glass. and with uh, wood to soil contact when we are dealing with um, wood to soil contact we have to look at uh, wood uh, and we have to think about a number of things with this uh, termites can easily access the wood from the ground uh, the moisture will eventually deteriorate the wood so the building code says um, exterior wood steps should not be in contact um, with the ground and exterior wood steps um, unless treated with a wood preservative well you know what in many jurisdictions that's not going to be acceptable either you're going to have to have no wood to soil contact and one of the reasons for that is uh, termites not that that prevents termites you can see how they crawl up the concrete they find wood it is actually amazing how they find the wood george brown college our e-building um, which I probably mentioned before, I was uh, uh, project managing for technology division um, that building. I, I was really stricken uh, about a year after it was constructed. I was in the um, hallway and the summer had passed, so we were back to school and I saw these tubes and I know what they are and I saw them going up the drywall and they were going, there was an oak handrail, cap rail on uh, the wheelchair ramp and they were going to the oak you know this is a concrete and steel building with hardly any wood in it yet they managed to find their way through get to that wall which is metal studs and drywall climb up the drywall and find the oak railing like they they can find wood like you wouldn't believe so in certain locations we have uh, termites and we have problems with it even in the city of Toronto the whole city of Toronto doesn't necessarily have termites but certain areas uh, really do and those areas tend to have been growing not shrinking over the last 25 years uh, so you've got certain areas of Toronto um, 
like the Danforth area, like Jane and St. Clair, uh, like uh, DuPont and Spadina. Those are areas which have pretty good termite infestations. So you have to be really cognizant of how you build. So building code tries to alleviate some of those, but local bylaws also uh, enact certain strict guidelines to try to reduce um, the potential opportunity and damage that termites can do. Um, there's a whole bunch of treatments that are all expensive regarding preventing um, termites from coming back. And one of the biggest issues with termites are they build these little tubes so they can get around that keeps them moist and keeps them protected. Uh, and, but they tend to eat wood from the inside out. So very often you don't know the damage is being done. It's just already done by the time you see it. And you can, you know, often you can put it like a, a screwdriver or a chisel, just push it right through the wood because it's been, in, it's been eaten from the inside out. So it really can be a devastating problem to a structure of a house uh, that occurs. I've even seen where their concrete slab in the basement was poured around the stair stringers and then they, because there was no concrete underneath, they came from the ground up through into the stair stringers. So um, they do have, uh, they are a problem and um, with the soil contact uh, you want to avoid. You want to avoid moisture as we've talked about in the cor course, the damage that moisture can do can be quite extensive and um, problematic. So uh, you also have carpenter ants which can cause um, extensive uh, problems to wood. Uh, they're a little bit easier to get rid of I would say, not totally easy, but a little bit easier to get rid of than termites. Termites are really a systemic problem in the city. Uh, and in a lot of places, not just here. It's why in some countries and some jurisdictions, they don't really build with wood because it's just so hard to protect against termite infestations. Uh, so here you can see the, the wood um, rotting. It could be uh, that it's, got, it's been exposed to moisture, or it could be that you have carpenter ants that are eating it. You tend to know and see the carpenter ants. Um, like here, you tend to see them a lot more readily, so it's a little bit more self-evident than it is with um, termites, although termites do give you this indication with the, with the tubes um, crawling up the side of the wall, but it could be that they're crawling up inside a wall that you don't know and can't see, um, so that can be causing that problem. We also have certain exceptions with building code where um, builders can actually cantilever out of stairs uh, from a foundation wall. I would say most times they don't bolt something out. Um, they usually actually um, have it reinforced out, but rather than go down the four feet with a, a footing, they have it sort of cantilevered out. Um, personally, I don't think it's a great practice uh, because still you run, they've got, they're allowing for some flexibility for frost heave and movement and different things here. Uh, personally, I think it's always best if you went down to uh, below the frost line with a footing all the way around. But building code does have some um, allowances built in there, so you might see that. So I just wanted to sort of um, give you that overview of a number of items uh, and how the building code really sort of interacts uh, with those particular areas and those are the minimum standards so you got to make sure that you're staying within those minimum standards and meeting those uh, requirements as a base level and stairs is an area if I was a building inspector I would be looking very closely at what's being done because if I'm a building inspector and there's problems later on with people falling and that sort of thing you know what a lot of it's going to come back on me because they will sue the city or the town and uh, as well as the builder and the, the trade that did the work. So you want to keep that in mind if, if I'm an inspector for sure because there's so many accident safety requirements uh, not being followed around um, stairs, handrails, guardrails, that's an area. So. Hopefully that's given you a good sense of building code requirements. And this falls out to a lot of other areas, of Ontario building code. Uh, but the guide to the code, as I mentioned, is a pretty good um, guide. And it, it's hard sometimes to read the building code and visualize it. So I think these types of illustrations that can sort of point to things and sections from the building code can be um, really helpful from that perspective. So. 
that's what I wanted to cover for today. This is Tom Stevenson signing off and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.